development session where we have um, Dr. Onduka Okoiso, who's a human resource professional with over 18 years experience in human resource management. Um, just a brief um, history, he's worked at Philip Consulting, where he's worked in the recruitment and training sessions, and he's also moved to KPMG, um, thereafter Elton Networks as the head of talent management. He's also had a stint at um, Forty Oil, and currently he's the head of human resources at Midwestern Oil and Gas. Dr. Onduka, uh, we're glad to have you on this session. Okay, thank, thank you very much, um, Yoming, and um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to speak at this session. So um, we'll be looking at the emerging trends in learning and development. As you rightly said, I currently head human resources at Midwestern Oil and Gas. Um, and what we do is we are into exploration and production. And as you all know, the price of crude is a bit quite low right now, but um, we're moving on. So I'll take questions at the end of my session. Um, then we'll rush one through it. So basically, we'll just look at the L and D. Um, what are those trends? So we look at pre-COVID. I mean, before COVID, what we normally do is um, after your appraisal, you, de you, de you develop your skill, you get your skill gap and, and um, skills gap. With skills gap, you then develop a training plan. Or maybe someone is moving into a new role. You know, you need to also upskill them and then you do, you do that. And also the mood in which you want to want to deploy this training is also what we also look at, like classroom. Right now, classroom is not really <laughs> what we are doing at the moment. Then you also look at e-learning, job shadowing, and also coaching and mentoring. Those are part of the most we use. The mobile learning is also coming to the foil, especially in some oil and gas organization. And also we do a lot of blend, also blended learning is also something we also do. And depends on the diversity of your organization and how complex your learning objectives are. So whatever mode you choose, it depends on your budget, your workforce type, the size, and what you want to achieve and within the particular time frame. Suddenly COVID hits us. A lot of us don't, don't, were not expecting this. So we don't even know what to do, how to do, um, grow our trainings right now. Budgets are low, revenues are not coming as, as they should. So what has happened now, a lot of organizations have cut their learning budget or totally removed it. You know, so it starts has been a challenge. But we thank God for technology. I mean, with technology now, we can do a lot of things. I mean, we can imagine if there are no technology, how that would be communicating during this period. And also the good thing about technology that we are learning, course, is there's a lot of information out there. There's abundance of information that we can also use. And the thing about information now is that it is readily available everywhere, you know, to, for you to learn. And it's quite cost effective. It doesn't cost an organization a lot now to do that, you know, unlike before you had to go to a classroom and actually do that training. So those are these initiatives we need to start selling to our organization, how we're going to go around using this online training. And it's quite cost effective. So now, in terms of learning, as the change now has gone straight into is very participatory. A lot of people are taking, taking charge of their own learning. And it's social. It's no more a formal setting where you go to and say, oh, I want to go and learn something. You can learn on the go. A lot of us also belong to a lot of um, communities in terms of our, on our WhatsApp group, where we also learn, where we also share our learning. And it's quite also collaborative. So in learning, all, getting all this in terms of um, training and also learning, how do we go about upskilling our people? So it should matter is with this COVID thing, a lot of jobs have been sort of eroded, you know, and a lot of organizations are probably taking advantage of this in terms of getting rid of their dead weights. So what but, but you have also have employees where you still you still want to keep. And you know, so I think organizations also stand in the gap for their employees at this point in time. So we need to have a conversation with our employees and say, look, time things have changed now. Is a new skill set we need to develop, and this is how they have to they have to see the benefits for them also. So you don't appeal to their emotions; it's more of their self-interest you actually uh, you appeal to, and let them also realize that technology is not coming to take away their jobs. It's not. It's supposed to work hand in hand with employees so that you can deliver an organizational goal. It doesn't completely eradicate the um, employees' work. So also work they have to work in unisons to be able to achieve them. So you need to prepare our employees ahead of time to let them know that this means of skills you in terms of career progression, in terms of what you also 
want to achieve. And companies that have this upskilling program in place are doing very, very well. And using technology also helps us to, grow, to boost our productivity. Now, so those barriers, what kind of barriers can we, we be encounter in terms of upskilling? As I said, a lot of jobs are also be, are being lost, but also a lot of organizations don't even know the skill sets they also need at this point in time. So that can be a barrier for them. And employees are going to be also be worried that, okay, why well, am I learning something new? Like I have a friend in an oil and gas organization that I think is currently an accountant. So they're trying to move into, wants to move to, they want to move into HR. He's a bit wavy and like, why am I moving to HR? It's not what he wants and everything. So he needs to get that by. He must be interested in that for him to be able to also try to also learn from that because they don't get that by. Because people, adults only learn when they want to learn. So if they don't have that in place, so that discussion, it's very, very important to have so that they know that job is not on that threat. I also let them know what the benefits are in terms of I'm going to learn something new as I'm going to move forward. So in terms of learning, how do we like to take in our information? A lot of organizers, a lot of people learn from different styles, you know, some can be visual, someone like me, I learn, I'm, I'm visual in my learning. You have to show me how, what, what I'm supposed to learn, you know. Some are auditory by listening, by listening to you or listening to the person teaching, they learn that way. Some are tactile, they learn by doing, by practical. In our industry, for example, if you are trying to train someone how to repair a pump or even repair a generator, you have to, it's not a case of just sitting in class and just dishing out the information. Fine, that can be there, but it has to also be blended with some form of practical. So the person knows, oh, this is how, to, this is how I'm going to get this done. So that is also very important in this age that we're currently running now. Then in terms of adult learning, one thing I learned about adults is that we learn when we want to learn, you know, as more of experiential. You know, what has your experiences been? Share your experience with me. Those don't come and do a, down, a top, top down approach in terms of, okay, give me all the theories, but there's no experience to share that, okay, I'm learning this, I'm learning that. And we all learn from mistakes, you know, and it has to be methodical and systematic. And once I can see progress, you know, in terms of my career as I'm learning, and I tend to buy in more to understand what I also need to do so what so what are those barriers that can prevent us from also learning in terms of can be like trust why am i going to the nation pushing me to this particular to learn this what they have in mind you know or my supervisor are they moving me somewhere else i don't want to go to so all those come into play so for 2020 so what are those trends we'll be looking at so things a lot of trainings are going to be individualized you know in terms of like now a lot of people are participating in this training now it's not maybe the companies probably didn't send them but they just wanted to attend it they want to do that and also adaptive content delivery that's gamification it's the kind of game that you play well, some organizations have that, taken that on board those games you play and actually learning from it like in sales and marketing you know you do a lot of gamification in that so that's another way to learn that then soft skills is also very very important you can be technical but if you don't get your soft skills right like interpersonal communication skills, then I, there will be no growth in terms of where you want to be or where you want to go. Then augmented and virtual reality is also one area we'll also be looking at in, in the future. You know, because if you've practiced something, you've done it virtually, the sense is that you need to do it when, when it comes to the real deal for you to do that. Then online mentorship program would also, it's going to come to the fore a lot going forward. You know, because a lot of things are now digitalized. You don't have to be in the same room with the person for the person to also to mentor you. And also micro learning also is also very important. What is what, what is micro learning? Short short information you get at every point in time to, be able to for you to be able to do your job. You know, because now a lot of people send stuff to you via WhatsApp. Okay, this is how you do this, and this is how you do that. And you learn and gaining a lot from all that. Then also can also help user generated content. A lot of us work in different organizations, a lot of experiences we're getting in those organizations. So all that, and what we're getting, if you sort of put it in terms of content, they can then deploy that particular training. So all that also is coming to the fore in that. Then also incentivize the training. Incentivizing means that, okay, encourage people to also learn. And as a learn, let's, let us be some incentive around that. So all these I've just mentioned briefly, just to just rub our minds in terms of what we should be looking at in terms of L and D. So I'll take questions now, if we have any. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Doc. 
Just learning, I can barely hear you. Below your screen, where you can drop in your questions. If you have any, I would read Yes, doctor. Jimmy, I can barely hear you. There's a chat box. Yes, I'm seeing chat. Uh, under your screen, where you yes, can I actually can drop in your questions um, for doctor. Um, and Hello, doctor. Yes, I can hear you. All right. So there's a, there's a question here from Chinidu. And okay. he asks, please, could you give us some examples? Give us a what? Question from Chinidu. Yes. And the question is learning. Exam yeah, yeah, I, I didn't hear you. You're okay, doctor. Yes. All right. Um, the, the question, I'll repeat it again. From Chinidu. Can you give okay. us some examples of how we can incentivize learning? Okay. Okay. For you to be able to incentivize learning, things, what I saying that if you know, like now, um, Nigeria is very, very, very degree recognized, we recognize a lot of degree. For people that you know, okay, that always quest for knowledge, always quest for new things, you can help, part of what you can do is put them on projects, you know? So at the end of the project, products of stage, you can do, I, I, I'm, I'm support giving cash in terms of that project. I support like giving some, some form of benefits, like for my organizations, there's some projects we work on, and because they know, oh, we can express always eager, at the end of the project, be successful, something's always given to that group to share, you know? That's one way you can incentivize um, training. And another, another thing you can also do is that you can say, okay, if you're going on this particular training, you can set certain things aside for your employees, just to encourage them to also try and attend those trainings that you want to do. So those are those two examples I'm sharing with you right now. Okay. There's another question on the screen, um, and it's an anonymous attendee. He asks, uh, for a company with 20 people that has reduced income at this time, uh, that, has what? Do we, that has reduced income. Okay, yes. Yes. How do we get HR uh, motivate for management to prioritize learning for its employees. Okay. Well, what, one of the things I'll say for those kind of things, thank God for the web. You know, because a lot of exec would think, okay, the training my staff want to go for, they have to go to a place or something to do, and then we pay per diem and we pay all that. What, what we can do in such instances is that we can focus on this web online learning, you know, like I said, I said earlier, we have a lot of user-generated content. There are a lot of learning programs. And can, like, for example, even your MD of an organization, there's a lot of knowledge he wants to share, depending on the training you want to attend or he wants to do. He can deploy that training via online. And that way you can do, when, for example, this is an HR tech conference. There's a lot of HR people on ground right now. So you can, as an HR person, talk to this HR, let them bring something together and then share with your staff or what you need to develop yourself on. It doesn't have to be formal all the time going to a classroom. You, know, you can leverage on your network to also get people that you know, okay, this guy works in a particular industry, this is what they do. Call them, you can do something online. So it's not going, and they're not going anywhere per se. So you can train like 20 of those staff online, very cost effective. And maybe at the end of the day, you can just give those guys honorarium at the end of the, or something, or maybe some of your gift items from your organization. I think that's the aspect you need to come from it and also show them the advantage of attending this particular training. Like for us now, because, because we've said to ourselves, look, we can't do any training, start going on one classroom training. So what we're trying to do, we're developing in-house facilitators within our organization. Because if you've been in this industry, I, for example, some of your staff, they have 10, 15 years experience. They have a lot to share. They can also talk to other people in other organizations that also have experiences in those particular area. Bring them on board. They can do something online for you, especially during this period. You know, it's just about your relationship you have with these people and you're able to deploy that training. But if you go and meet your boss and say you want to do a particular training, it's going to cost X amount of money. You're going to already get a no from the beginning. So we need to be able to put in a lot. We have to sort of come from a different angle. It doesn't have to be the same way we do things before. 
you know, like for me now, I know someone that probably does something. I just call a friend. Oh, please, we need so, uh, um, certain things in this particular engineering area. Can you help us? Just an online training for my people. And they attend and they log in. And, it's, and they're doing it from the comfort of their homes right now. So we need to make use of this technology that we are currently using. So our approach is very important. We have to achieve that. questions come in and I'll read it as it comes on the screen. Um, but doctor, right before I go to the next question, I, I was just going to ask, I know you mentioned some things about, you know, for organizations getting, adapting to the new situation. And yes. uh, you would agree with me that we find ourselves in an unfamiliar situation right yes. now. Yes. There's a growing demand for each of professionals to lead the change. Yes. So I adopted the learning by doing approach because yes. this was expected. Hmm. What are your tips for HR professionals looking to improve learning agility within the organizations? Okay. First of all, what I, what I would say for as an HR professional, first, first, first and foremost, you need, to be, you need to be there for your employees. Plan, like for probably previous appraisals you've done. One thing you can also do, click, find, identify what gaps your people current, um, currently have and how you want to close them. And also sit with my and say, look, these are the gaps. We know we cannot have um, classroom training. We cannot send our people on training. And come up with a plan to say, and get in, come up with a plan and say, okay, these are the areas we need to close for certain of our employees. Apply your top, one of our top talents, you know, how you want to also keep them. And so these are the plans we have in place and how we want to deploy the training. We have gone ahead to sort of get certain facilitators to be able to do this for us online. It's quite cost effective. We're not going to pay much, and this is the value we are also going to get. And I said that also ties into also incentivizing your employees in terms of attending training because you need to have that conversation with them because they are part of the conversation. You know, you can't just say, okay, I want to train you on this. They have to also have the, get the buy-in in terms of, okay, this is what's going to be beneficial to me. And they have to also see the progression in their career if I attend this particular training. So HR needs to be able to build that result, to be able to carry everybody along. Like for now, what I'm doing in my organization, we have sort of identified the competency gaps. So now what we are doing, we are putting a plan together to say, okay, all these competency gaps, who are the people internally that can close them? Because as I said, you have people in the, in the organization 15, 20 years experience in oil and gas. You know, like for example, some like fundamentals of oil and gas. I don't see why we should go outside and get some. We have people inside that can teach that. You know, so those are sort of ingenuities we need to put in place and HR needs to lead that. And then share with your senior manager or executive management, these are the things we have. These are the gaps we have. These are the facilitators and help and also the, try and help the facilitators and also join out the curriculum. So how to do the presentations and all and put it online, how we are going to hold it to our particular staff. But at the end of the day, let them know that okay, this is what's going to be beneficial to me. It's how I see my career moving forward. As I said, you have to appeal to their self-interest, not their emotions. Because at the end of the day, people will say, oh, why is it training us on this? But it has to be beneficial to them, and they have to also see the benefits that comes to them. Well, you raised a very valid point in the <laughs> speaking to... Um, the emotions, but I'll come to that. Let me take this interesting question from Josephine. And she asked, for an employee who doesn't like to read or do any online course, how do you handle it? Oh, that's, 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 that's a very good one. Well, one, well, one, one thing I would say from my own experience, you don't like to read, you don't like to do any online course. Let them also know that, look, if for you to have career growth within this organization, these are, these are certain skill set that we require. How, you want, how do you want to get that particular skill set? And as I mentioned earlier, some people's learning styles are different. Some are auditory, some are visual, and some are tactile. You know, so we need to understand, okay, how does this person like to learn? This person might not like to reach, that means it's not visual. Does person like to learn by audio? Or does the person like by, learn by doing? You know, so it's when you learn by doing, you need to be able to identify as others, HR, and say, okay, this are the, if, you, if you don't do this, this, this is where you, you'll be stuck here. For us to have career progression, maybe you are the kind of person that likes, as I said, examples, you want practical things, you want virtual, all those things. So we need to identify who that person is and I'll try and find their best learning style. I believe everybody will want to learn, but we need to identify that the best learning style is best for them. 
And as Shilani said, maybe a person likes to read. A person likes to listen. A person likes to learn by doing, you know. So all that we need to identify first before we can then find out how we can further train that particular individual. All right. And going back to, you know, what you previously said, because that's a very interesting thing you mentioned in terms of speaking to these emotions. And uh, we'll see the pandemic has added speed to changes that were already up in the ages. Uh, the passion economy has opened up and suddenly people are doing a lot of gig work because yeah. employees are remotely. Mm. Now, how can L&D adjust its strategies to work cohesively with the gig economy? Because there has to be a balance between meeting the demands of the company and meeting the needs of the flexible workforce who have a strong desire to um, invest in themselves. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. Um, the gig economy, as I said, like we are working from home now. Some people are probably have you no know, initially, like four or five months ago, you say, oh, we we'll work from home. A lot of people say, no, it cannot happen, light. But now we're doing it uninhibited. And if you notice, we are very productive right now. Because when you're in the office, you have a lot of distraction, corridor cruising, someone coming to your office, or someone dragging into a meeting that is unnecessary. So be able to work with this gig economy, as I said, it's more about self-interest. What, how did it benefit them? If you are applying to their emotions, it may not work. But if, if, if I see, okay, what is the need for me? If I don't with him, what is the need for me? So we need to identify what is the need for them. A lot of them want to be flexible in their work. So that's all in terms of l and ensure that, okay, training is also flexible. You can do training at your own time, like e-learning, you can do it at your own time. I said, mob, using your mobile devices, so mobile learning is also coming to the fore. Micro learning, those are also things we can also see, sending some small, small information to them and also building content. And they are at home and they are learning, they're on their bed, they're also learning. But for them, you tell them, come to this particular place, come and sit down in front of you and also learn with everybody. They might not be interested. But if you create a bit of the, the, the material is there, the content is there, and they can access it at any time, then that's the way you bridge that gap as l &D. So those are part of the strategies we need to put in place understand our, um, our workforce dynamics, because in some organizations you have a lot of millennials and geeks there. So you have to understand that dynamic, and also the industry you are playing in. If you are playing in the tech industry, it's going to be different from mm -hmm. oil and gas, aviation, manufacturing. So the strategy is going to vary across this particular industry. Okay. okay. I'll take three more questions, uh, but you can keep the questions coming in the box, um, and we can always send to Dr. Onduka to um, attend to the questions which he may be unable to attend to at this point. Um, there's another question from an anonymous participant, and he says, what are some of the challenges in Nigeria that we should anticipate as we transition to virtual learning? Number one, data. Two, power. You know, because a lot of people have been saying, oh, I don't have enough data, my data is finished, they don't have power. It's very power that generates also that is a general. They're saying it's costing money, money rather than sitting down in the office. I benefit from office, from the office internet. So those are some of the talents we have. And some people make the house is also not conducive for them to also learn. You know, or some people, as I said, some people don't even have laptops. You know, maybe they use desktop and desktop is in the office. You know, so this is so they have to keep going to the office to sit down and get work done. So some of, those are some of the challenges a lot of people have been constrained with. And even when you do get that data. As I said, it's not as top notch as you want it to be. You are saying something, it cuts off. Or you're working on, like a, a colleague of mine was telling me yesterday, she was working on something from home and suddenly the data just cut off. You know, so that little, little challenges in terms of infrastructure, we still have to also deal with in this part of the world. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, we do understand that data could be, is a very big challenge for us, especially in this part of uh, the world in Nigeria. Uh, and, you know, we have traditional upskilling programs. Um, like the lectures and webinars and online courses. Mm. Um, but right now, you also mentioned the key thing, which has to do with gamification platforms, yes. um, which offers employees a personalized and tailored learning experience. Yes. Uh, how can organizations tap into this mod model? Well, first of all, they have to see value. You know, it's about value. What value is going to give me? And I'm a, I'm a proponent of seeing, oh, has it worked in this organi other organization in the same industry with me? If yes, that means there's a chance of my work in my own organization. So who deployed it for them? I, so there's no point going to start getting 20 people to come and bid for it. So I find out who deployed that for them because my own organization is peculiar. We have games that we can use in my organization to get things done properly. So those are 
part of what we, the organization start looking at. And that's, I said, you have to see the, is the value you have to sell to them to know, okay, for gamification in terms of my productivity, it's going to help me this way because it's been done in this other organization. So technically it might work for my own organization, but it hasn't been done in this particular, indo hasn't been done in this particular industry. It's just been done in maybe the banking industry and no one has done gamification in oil and gas or telco. I might be wary. But if it's done in oil and gas and if it's done in a similar organization like mine, it's a good selling point. So we need to do our research well before I start going to sell it to um, my executive management that, okay, let's go with gamification. I said, it's not about, I said something earlier in terms of learning. The organization should find out what's the best fit for them, not the latest, not the latest technology. It's what, what best suits my organization in terms of learning. And then we'll go with the gamification. It may not work for certain organization. It may work for other organizations. So you have to understand your people dynamics and the people we have within that organization. That's where HR comes to the fore on that. Yes, um, thank you for the question. Um, we have someone who says, fresh graduates of educational management and wants to start a career in human resource management. Uh, what steps can one take to establish a career in HRM during this COVID period? That's a... Good one. Um, okay, I'll just uh, maybe share experience. What I what I always believe in is first of all, um, I see a lot of push approach in terms of okay, because A is doing this, let me to run in it, let me to run that way. You know, it's a question of is this something I'm really really interested in. If yes, okay, what do I need to do? And the question of what's the person doing right now? Is the person in an organization working or the person is not working? So if you're in an organization right now but you're not currently doing HR. I think it's always best to also start and see how you can lend yourself or start doing working, doing some stuff with them. Although each has a lot of confidential information, but see how you can start showing yourself in terms of my interest in HR and start thinking of getting the, also the necessary certification. But what I always advocate for that, the best way to start HR if you start in a consulting organization. It also helps because you have to see the whole spectrum, you know, before you now tailor it down to an, a particular industry. So to move to HR, first of all, you can start your certification program because you're going to be networking with other people that want to do HR. Then from the internship program can also come up, which you can also try and be a part of. Then in this period of sitting at home, try and read a lot of stuff on how HR is and how things are done. But sometimes I feel what you sometimes you read is different from what you actually practice within certain organization. That's why I always say, start with consulting first, read a lot of materials, network with a lot of HR people, you know, attend some of these webinars that we're currently doing right now. I intend to learn, but I believe in learning by doing. You know, you can read a lot of, like I, I tell people, if you read the manual on how to drive a car, it's so complicated. But when you actually do it, put it in gear, put, just put it in drive, and you're driving along. So it's with this practical aspect, and you also, as I said, interest has to be there. It's not because A and B wants to do HR. You just must think, because right now everybody thinks they know HR. There's a lot of, a lot of things involved in it. You know, so it's a part of, first of all, interest is very important. Very, very important. Just building the question, um, it just got me think, thinking. Um, some weeks back, you know, I was privileged to be with um, a group of individuals. And um, a question was raised where um, if people had the option of getting a degree without attending any class, how many students would opt for it? And you will guess that the uh, majority said they would get the certificates whilst not attending um, the Last. program itself. Um, so that the certificate gives people a head start and places them in the job market. Um, but suddenly, the pandemic has come around and we are faced with a new reality. So, uh, what advice do you have for HR professionals in terms of reskilling its workforce during these changing times? Okay. What I will say is that um, your certificate just says, you might get a BSc, MSc, or PhD always says that, not to say that you have gained knowledge in that area. It doesn't mean you have competence in that particular area. They're two, they're two different things. So your degree, of, the degree tells you that, oh, I have gained knowledge in this particular area. Because you hear people say, well, I have a 2-1, I have a first class from X university. Or that tells you that you have gained knowledge in that particular area, but you don't have the competence. So how do I get the competence by actually getting a job in that particular role and actually functioning in that Area. I, I've said before, the best way, I mean, it's going to be a bit difficult because you can't learn, you can't learn those particular skills while doing online. You have to actually be doing, doing the work. So for me, I just network a lot of HR professionals and try and understand how things work. Start from the basics. You know, your mind has to be open. Learn from the basics. Okay, what is HR all about? 
there are different parts of HR. Which, what, which one catches my interest? Which one do I want to run with? But it's always best to know the whole spectrum of HR. It's very, very important. This period might be a bit dicey, but I think by learning, you learn by doing, actually. And by doing, making your mistakes, understand, okay, why that make them and learn from those mistakes, then you now start to build yourself. As I said, I'm, I, I, I'm a doctor by profession, but I doubled into HR, you know? And this took several years. It's not something I learned in one day, you know? I had to go through the, through the ropes to learn it. You know, a lot of yaps, a lot of mistakes here and there, but thank God one is growing and doing what one needs to do. But I said, don't be afraid to fail. You know, failing is part of learning. You know, you fail, you shake yourself up and you move on again. You know, just keep going and just keep have at the back of your mind, what's the worst that can happen? You know, that's what I would say, what's the worst that can happen? And the worst happens, you shake it up and you move on again and you keep going and keep learning. Nobody was born with this thing. We all learn as we're going along. I'm still learning as I am now, as I'm going along. Learning and keep growing. That's what I would advise. With an open mind. Interesting. Yes. Interesting. Um, I'll take this last question from Mudupe Bankoli. And, and it's a question that usually comes up in most conferences. And she asks, who should push training and development activities more, employees or employers? Mm, I, I always say your career is in your hands, number one. Empl um, employers know they're there to make money, really. That's, that's the first thing of an employer. I'm here to make the money I, can, I, I made. But a sensible employer is okay. I need to also upskill my people to ensure they meet where I want to, where I want to get to. But employees also should also be able to push their own training on what they want to learn. What you learn is for you, you know. And at the end of the day, you so it's a two prong approach, you know. Empl employers that know what they want and where they want to get to, they also need to push that. So okay, training is important. We're learning organization. We need to get to the end of it. And as I said, organization wants to make money at the minimal cost. You know, so that's what the employees say, okay, I need to understand this training. I need to understand this um, skill set. I need to have the skill set. I want to be able to deliver on the goals you have set for me. So it's a two-way approach. And I said, it's about self-interest because the employer knows that, okay, if I train this particular um, employee in this particular area, it's going to make X amount of money for me. So that's the self-interest for the employer. You know, and for the employee, say, okay, if I learn this particular skill, it's for me. And I've gained it, and I can go and sell it anywhere I want to go to. So it's a two-way traffic, really. And it's all about what I'm going to get at the end of the day. Thank you, very much, Doctor, for your time. Really appreciate this session. It's been an insightful session with you. Mm -hmm.